look over there. All right. Good we're evening, live. everybody. Tonight, we have the pleasure of Rudy Lopez going to show us our winged bowl. Rudy is here from Tampa, Florida. I'm going to turn it over to Rudy and let him do his thing. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rudy. Appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm enjoying the weather here. <laughs> Makes me feel right at home. Is that too loud? And I, oh, okay. All right, thanks. I tend to talk a little loud. I come from a Spanish family, so we're kind of loud and obnoxious. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I always like to start out because I'll get busy at the end. I'll run full time, and I won't have time to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, obviously, we're short on chairs just about. Um, I know you guys have a pretty good membership, and I appreciate everybody coming out. Um, if it wasn't for all of you, I can't do this. So I do appreciate it, and I appreciate the opportunity to turn my hobby into an occupation somewhat. Um, I've done that three times in my career. But uh, I do enjoy it. I do have fun doing what I'm doing. And uh, I thank everybody for coming out, allowing me to join you guys and do this. And I look out, and I've met a lot of people over the years. I've been to SWAT a couple of times and um, see a lot of friends that I get to spend some time with, not very often but uh, I do appreciate the uh, time spent. Um, I do like to say it is a hobby. A friend of mine has little business cards because he started getting way too busy and he wrote on the card or his cards say it's just a hobby because he doesn't want to make it a job. But it, um, it has become a little bit of an occupation and I really do like doing what I do. Um, I like to kind of just mention to most people that are uh, doing it for fun, keep it fun. You don't have to be a demonstrator. You don't have, of course, the club would like you to, I'm sure, because we're always short of demonstrators. But um, don't get upset about stuff. Um, a lot of the things that I do um, maybe seem a little difficult or whatever, but it's just they're not anything that's really super strange or odd, but they're very, very good skill building um, projects. Um, when I started, I started, we were discussing this at dinner tonight, I started doing spindle work. How many people do spindle work? How many people go out and actually practice spindles? Yeah, a few hands. I mean, you know, some of you do. Um, most people just want to, and I understand, turn a bowl because that's what we like. Um, but I started it with spindle work, and some of my projects are spindle oriented. A lot of my projects are intermittent cut type projects. Um, that really, I learned when I started out, the intermittent cut really helps you develop pretty good skills because you can't do a lot of the things you do on a smooth, round bowl blank. You can't push too hard, you can't use dull tools. It emphasizes all the things I feel are really important, and that's number one, sharp tools. I'm a sharp tool fanatic. Um, I was taught how, you know, how important that is from the very beginning, and I'll emphasize that, we'll talk about it. And uh, the next thing is good tool control. And you get the good tool control by learning the proper technique, and what I like to uh, refer to as bevel-supported cuts. Not all the cuts we make are bevel-supported, but to get a good, clean finish, that's kind of what I'll discuss a little bit tonight. So um, to, to do that on intermittent surfaces where the wing or a corner, like on the squared around project, all of that, it's, um, it really improves your technique because you have to float the tool. You have to float the tool over the intermittent cut. So that's what we're going to play with tonight is uh, like my little wing bowl. Um, also, I'll mention that uh, my introduction was Rudy Lopez, and that's my name, but my true full given name is Rudolph Lopez, and I only say that because I have a website that has handouts. So instead of having to worry about notes or keeping track of everything, there's handouts for a lot of the projects. Uh, the one thing, that the, what we're going to do tomorrow is the squared around project, and that's a handout. There's like multiple pages on that. And then there's one for the wing bowls, and there's a lot of different variations on the wing bowls. Um, the ones up here on the corner, I'm going to do something like uh, probably that one tonight. It'll be a bowl sort of emerging out. I know you can't see it too good from back there. Um, it can be functional or non-functional. People look at a lot of pieces like they look at um, art, and my wife does not like modern type impressionistic art. She has to. See, she always first question is, what is it? And if it doesn't look like something, she doesn't like it. I've gotten her away from that. I've gotten her to just say, do you like the colors? Do you like the shape? Do you like anything about it? Well, what is it? <laughs> She's quit asking that question. But some people look at the little wing bowl project and they say, well, what do you do with that? 
Um, it's just a fun little thing to do. It's a fun skill builder. It's a bowl in a wing. Um, but there is some functionality to some of the pieces, and I'll discuss kind of how to lay them out and everything like that. But basically, I like to emphasize, go at it, have fun doing it. And when I started this, my teacher, uh, Ron Browning, uh, told me to make sure I tell everybody at the demo that I can promise everybody in the room one thing, and that is that at least one person in here is going to have fun doing what they do and enjoy their evening tonight. And if it's that is only me, I apologize to everybody else in the room. So um, we'll go forward. This is the blank I'm going to do. Uh, this is a uh, project for Saturday. OK, so a um, piece of cherry. Um, it's missing some bark. It, would be a, it is going to be a live edge or natural edge, because I'm going to have a bowl on the top part. But we have lost some bark around the edge. I've tried to peel some of it off, because you guys don't have the shield up here. Um, I did this at SWAT. About three years ago, I was doing this demo in SWAT. I don't know if anybody was there. And uh, I cut through the bottom of the bowl and slung it around in pieces. Was anybody there to remember that one? OK, thanks. Thank you very much. That was planned. I, uh, <laughs> it's knock on wood. It's the only one I've cut through. And, uh, but it was spectacular. Uh, luckily, nobody got hurt. They didn't have shields, but the pieces were pretty thin and small when they kind of dispersed into the audience. Um, but I was out of time. I was like hurrying, and I thought, I didn't stop to measure, and Ron used to tell me, measuring's free. You can do it as much as you want. It doesn't cost you anything. But I was behind. I'm looking at the clock in the back of the room, and they're always telling us, get the heck out of the room, because the next demonstrator's got to come in. So I'm cutting. And I don't know if you ever heard the sound. I call it the scratchy potato chip sound. It's just like you're scratching on a potato chip or a rat chewing on a box. It's like just before you go th through it, you hear this and I heard that sound, and I just, just turned the gal just quick, but it was too late. You see the little silver rings go around, and it was just history. But uh, the, the interesting part was the video guy did not put a DVD in the recorder. So it never happened. <laughs> I really missed that, because I wanted that for my outtakes, because I had never had one go to pieces that spectacularly. But anyway, um, there's a lot of things that uh, can go wrong, obviously. but. Um, the next year at SWAT, they had screens, they told me. <laughs> so don't know if I was instrumental in doing that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, the handout covers uh, you know, the steps. I kind of break things down into 10 steps, more or less. And I had to start somewhere with the process when I started demonstrating. So the first thing I put on the handout is evaluate the log, decide on a design. So it's where how you're going to mount it, what you're going to do with it. Um, which way it's going to go. Um, this one will have a bowl emerging out of the top. The wings will curve down somewhat, so it'll probably sit on the wings. It depends how much it twists. If I move the wings upward, then it'll sit on the bowl. Um, I did one a couple of evenings ago, and it was really nice. It sat on the bowl, it would just spin on the bowl. I kind of do a round bottom bowl, and it just teeters and totters on the, on the bowl. So either way you do it, I mean, it doesn't matter. There's a million variations, as the handout has some pictures. Um, but to do a functional platter or something, I a lot of times use this for the platter part and this for the base part. So that means I would just orient it differently. This one, the tenon's going to be on this side. And if you do a platter that's flat on the top, then the tenon would obviously be on this side. And most of the times, I'll go ahead and run it through the saw again. And I'll cut some of this off so I don't have to remove it with the, the gouge and all that. Um, I do a lot of functional platters out of obviously bigger crotch pieces. Uh, I sort of got into that because it's such beautiful wood and figure, and it makes a very nice platter, which a lot of you have done that. You can do a larger, just natural edge bowl out of here, but the platters are kind of unique. And if you do a platter, I always put a tenon on it and then leave a ring of wood outside of that tenon. And then the ring becomes feet. I'll carve out. Sometimes I don't have to carve it out here, because I'll have a foot, a ring that would be out this far. So I end up with a foot here, a foot here, and a foot here when I carve between them or leave the gap here. So that gives me a three-footed stool that no matter how this warps, because this isn't really green, but when they're real nice and green, I like to turn them relatively thin, and they can twist and move. And it, gives a little interest to the platter just organically that something that I didn't do it just nature took its course so that's how it sets up but this one will be drive spur on this side so either way cut it flat so you have good flat surfaces or something to get a good safe bite on um, I've drilled past the bark and the cambium layer down to solid wood on the top 
And I have a four-prong spur. I like a larger inch and a half four-prong. I have one of the big uh, Texas drives, which is about two and a half or two inches, and it's got six prongs for bigger pieces to give you a little more stability on it. Um, I'm going to go, again, I'll um, kind of discuss a few things, and I'll tell a, uh, give you a lot of information. I tend to talk a little fast, so you, you get a, generally a whole lot more information on my demos because I tend to give you a whole lot more information on a shorter period of time because I tend to talk a little fast. But I try to slow that down. I am from Florida down south, but we don't talk all that slow sometimes. Um, but anyway, the piece is when it was uh, sawing it is kind of one of the safety things that I want to discuss quickly because uh, I usually need all the time I can get. This is a little bigger than I normally do, so it takes a little longer to get some of the bulk out of this. But when I saw these, um, some of them I cut with a chainsaw, some I'll cut with a bandsaw. This was cut on the bandsaw, but you got to be careful either way. Um, the chainsaw operation involves trying to get the saw to go through here. Uh, if you, a lot of people will take a large crotch piece. These are a little difficult with a chainsaw. I recently bought a little short pruner saw, and it makes some of these small crotch pieces a little bit easier. But trying to do this with a 20-inch or a 25-inch bar like I have is, is a little bit difficult. Um, so I have a saw buck uh, made out of 2x4s that interlock and thread, and they kind of open and close. And it's about 28 inches tall, so I, it gets me up off the ground. I don't have to bend over. Um, a lot of people will try to saw a crotch piece or even a log and they'll put two logs down by each other on the ground and they'll stick the thing up in the middle. And that will hold it and work, but the problem is you're very close to the ground. So you can't just bend over and start sawing, sticking the saw chain up here. Because the first thing's going to happen, the chain's going to hit this, there's no support, and it's just going to fling the thing back at you. Best of the worst scenario is it hits you in the shin, you hop around, it hurt, and there's no big damage. The, the worst case of the worst scenario is you're leaned over the saw, it fires around, the big crotch piece comes around, hits the nose of the saw, saw comes up, hits you in the head because you're leaning over. There could be difficulties. So what you have to do is you have to engage the dog teeth, the dogs that they call them on the back of the saw, in this area to keep it from spinning backwards. So that's the dog teeth are back here, you engage it in there, and then you work your saw down through the piece. It's very difficult to do on the ground. It's easier to do on a saw buck because you have to get the back of the saw very low, which if you're on the ground, it's not going to get on the, you know, you're just not going to be able to engage the teeth for safety. So if you don't know how to do it, uh, check with somebody who's had a little experience. You know, just be very careful. I don't want anybody to get hurt slinging these pieces around or taking a chainsaw someplace in the face or whatever. Um, if I do them on the band saw, you can run into the same problem, and that is when you it, the saw blades going up and down, as it hits an unsupported corner, it can want to flip this thing forward and jam it into the blade. Again, the best of the worst is you break your blade, maybe break your guides. Uh, the worst of the case is somehow it grabs your hands and pulls them into the saw blade as it flips over. So what I do is, if you notice, when this is sort of level, this corner right here is not cantilevered out as much as this would be if I was flat and this is two inches or more out. So I have more leverage and it wants to flip over that way, where this way, with this side being more supported, I will cut this off at a little bit of an angle to sort of raise that corner up so when it engages, there's more downward force and I got support here, so it tends not to pull it down. So I can engage it in, my hands are on the outside, and as it passes through the middle, then here, I've never had it want to pull it down sideways on the back part, or you know, kind of pull it this way, because you're pushing it forward, and it just seems to go right through, and by this time, your hands are past the blade, and things seem to be good. So again, just be careful with it, um, but that's how I split these. They're, they're a little bit, you know, not complicated, but you kind of like to cover a little bit of that. So my spur drive is here. I'm going to change something around here. Yep. I think I need to make an adjustment. Bear with me a second. Uh, well, all right, I've got to change things around. Too many. There we go.
Really? That's very bizarre. It actually locks there, so we'll see how that works. I'll draw it. It has. Wow, that's really weird below. I am definitely not used to that. Will it? How about if it goes the other way? It's not going to work either that way. Nope, not quite enough slack either way. It's going to have to go that way. I've turned on one of these before and I didn't have that problem. I'd be sawing that baby off a little bit. <laughs> yeah, oh well. Didn't mean to hold the show up, but that just seems going to be odd. I'll work with it. We're professional, we can handle any difficulty, right? Like a professional transmission repairman. Yeah. All right, let's try to do this. Between centers, um, the whole, people say, do I measure it or nothing? No, I'm pretty abstract about this. I just kind of put it on the uh, drill press, or if I drill it by hand, just kind of eyeball it, center it up. Um, we'll see how the balance works sometimes. Hopefully there's two, two weights of wood over here, one over here. It may sort of balance up. Um, how many people will be turning, maybe trying this project on a mini lathe? Or anybody that does this? Okay, no, I have to worry about it. Mini lathes are a whole other difficulty because if you don't have a variable speed mini, then you have to start out at one RPM, and that's 480 or 500. And for any little oddball crotch piece or something, that might be out of balance. So when you turn it on, lock it in real good like I show you, and then step aside and turn it on, turn it off, and make sure if it gets too wonky, be ready to turn it off, because these things, you know, obviously aren't a balanced piece of wood. I've got, I don't drive the spur in and then stick it in. I will try to, I have a, about a two inch hole there, sometimes I drill a bigger hole so on bigger pieces because it allows me to recenter it if I want to, kind of move it one way or the other. And then if I want to shift it, like I'm going to leave it with this side flat and, or I might tip it a little bit to take a little bit more off of this section and level up a little more of the peaks. Right now one, the peak of this is going to be way higher than those, so it allows me to kind of pivot maybe like that, so I'm taking off a half an inch of this before I hit this. Something like that. So I may not shift it quite that much. If it is too out of balance, I might move it around. But that's kind of close to where I'll be. So once I find a nice, I will spindle lock it. Is there? There we go. So I twist, and I'm just wiggling the spurs. I'm driving the spurs in. Try to. If you have a lathe like this, a Jet or my Robust has a sliding headstock, Powermatic, not only do you have to check with the tailstock lock, but make sure the headstock's not slipping. Because if the headstock slips a little, you know, you should kind of know that, but I just tighten this in. So that's pretty snug between centers there. And one other thing that I don't do, and this is maybe not OSHA or AAW Pro, but I don't tighten my quill lock. Um, I am in the habit of turning a lot of green wood, so I'm always checking the, the tightness of this. So as I turn, it'll bounce a bang a little bit. I'll tighten it, I'll check it. Every time I do something, I check it. So just a good thing to be, if you like to tighten the quill lock, then by all means, tighten the quill lock. But just remember to check it. Um, I've been teaching a lot at Campbell and Aramont, different places or classes at my studio. I have a nice studio set up at home, climate controlled now, which has been a blessing past few years, it's real nice to be inside with AC. And I've got four lathes, so I can do four students at a time. So when I teach, I'm always walking up to a lathe, gonna check on somebody or show somebody something. First thing I do, I put my hand on the wheel while they're standing in front of the thing, and I, you know, I just give it a test to see if it's tight. A lot of times I'll walk up, check it, it's tight, and then I loosen this, and I give it like one and a half turns. 
And I was like, hmm, that was pretty loose, and this thing's between centers. If it came loose or whatever, it could be wobbling, could come out. So be safe with the green wood. Make sure everything's good. All right, so. Um, and I started to tell you, I, I apologize. I do have a little bit of uh, ADD. So I need some people that have seen my demos. I, I kind of tend to jump around. I started to tell you my name's Rudolph Lopez. The name of the website is RudolphLopez.com. So if you Google RudolphLopez.com, that's how, the easiest way to find the, the website. If you Google Rudy Lopez, a lot of it does come up because I have been doing a lot more stuff with that. But uh, one of the first things that comes up is a really nice Cuban fellow down in Miami that has warrants out for domestic violence. So I'd rather you do Rudolph. You know, it's, it's a little better. Um, I've got uh, basically two types, two styles of gouges. I don't have a bunch of different angles or anything. Um, a 5 8 uh, Ellsworth grind, or some people don't call, say don't call it Ellsworth. It's an Irish grind, fingernail grind, sweatback grind, whatever you want to call it. It's pretty standard. I use the Ellsworth jig to sharpen it with, so that's kind of uh, what I started with. Um, it has uh, a secondary bubble on it. I don't know if the camera's got too much glare or whatever, but there's a secondary bubble. That has nothing to do with it. That's just a heel relief to shorten the bevel contact of my primary bubble that's actually the working bevel. Um, about 60 degrees. I can, I can tell you it's exactly because the jig sets it up and that's what it is. I'm not going to fuss you know, about bevel angles. Some people like 60, 65, 55, 54 and a half. I mean, it, it really, the wood doesn't know as long as you're consistent. Um, 60 does, it's kind of my workhorse. It does most of what I want to do all the time. And I have a 40 degree, which is more pointy. So if looking at the two from edge, you have a pointier and same thing, heel relief on it, nice and sparkly on the 60. But you can tell there's 20 degrees difference in the uh, 40 degree. And it's a half inch gouge. So all my half inch gouges are mostly ground at 40 degrees with a heel relief as well. Again, um, it is less contact of the wood surface. It turns tighter radiuses, but there is just less contact when it's actually touching the wood. So, and I don't know if you notice in that one, there's a red line. You guys can see this. I'll kind of try to wipe it out without cutting my finger. So, have you ever had Glenn Lucas to swat and stuff? Uh, Glenn Lucas sh showed me this many years ago. And this was one of his big teaching aids. Takes a big fat Sharpie marker, makes a bit of red line down the, down the flute. So when I'm teaching, I tell everybody, if you're seeing there's not a safe bevel supported cut that you're gonna make, or just about any cut that you're gonna make with this gouge, you, you should be seeing that red line. From, from standing in a good position where you're standing, you shouldn't see that. If you have the tool rolled halfway over about 45 degrees, and the flute is closed up about 45 from right here where I'm standing, I can't see the red line. If I turn the tool over toward me, which I'm gonna do a non-bevel supported cut, this would be a bevel supported, turn it over, and it would be a non-bevel supported cut. If I hold the tool at 45, it's pretty grabby. It can be done, but it's a little on the grabby side. So if I rotate about 10 more degrees over, I close that flute more to a sheery, safe, safer position, I can't see the red line even though I'm standing on this side. So it's, it's kind of a good safety thing. So I tell the guys, if you're seeing the red line, that means stop, danger, danger, stop, call me and see what you're doing. And you know, it, it's kind of a good thing to, as a reminder, if you're not familiar with that or if you're teaching people to turn or whatever, it's kind of just a little safety thing. So talking about bevel supported or non-bevel supported cuts, I tend to say that, like I said, I talk a little fast and at one of the AEW symposiums in a big room where I'm talking fast and I, say, I keep saying bevel supported cuts, uh, somebody said, oh, Rudy, what is a double supported cut? And I'm like, I don't know, what are you talking about? And they said bevel, I, oh, somebody hollered out. He says bevel supported cuts, he just talks too damn fast. So it's bevel supported cut is what I'm saying. And that means the cut is made with the bevel supporting the cutting edge. So that would mean I will do both in this throughout the night. But I'm going to start by doing a non-bevel supported. Some people call it a push cut or a pull cut. That's not necessarily a good description of the cut because I can pull a push cut and I can push a pull cut. I just, one is bevel supported, one isn't. So now that you're totally confused, um, if I stand, it depends on body position and handle position. So what it breaks down to is if the tool edge, the cutting edge that you're using is leading the cut, if it's in front of, it's taking the cut, 
then that's a bevel supported cut. It should be if you're on the bevel or what some people call a push cut. If the handle, as I turn it over, is now leading the cut, the handle is in front of the cutting edge coming this way, then that would be a pull cut. So the cut, and generally those are non-bevel supported. So if I do a bowl and I'm gonna go around the curve of the bowl, if I can put the handle farther over here and get on the bowl and pull it around the bowl on the bevel, the tool point is leading the cut, but I'm pulling it. If I don't want all the crap in my face on a green bowl, I can do the same cut standing over here and push it around, and now I'm pushing it, but it's the exact same cut. So just understanding that is kind of a, what, I, what I like to just get in a lot of uh, general information when I'm uh, trying to do this project. It just kind of gives me opportunity to talk about a lot of stuff. Um, hopefully, I really... I'm a little concerned about the bark. I tried, like I said, tried to chisel some of this off, but we'll see what happens. I turn the speed down, start to lay it up, and then bring it up to speed and double check everything. So this is all good. Banjo, tool rest. Tool rest is a little bit high. I want, to, I want the cut to happen right on the center line, so I like my tool down a little bit. I didn't break out my platform tonight for this lathe, because this lathe is actually relatively low. It's still about three or four inches high for me. I like about elbow high, so if I'm up about this high, that's better for me. I like to be just about, it's just a guideline, but I do like to be up a little higher, especially on the wing bowls or any bowls, really, because I can look down into it. You tall guys got this view all the time, but a lot of shorter people, they're, they've been looking at it this way all the time, looking into it, and you can't see what I want to see. I want to look over the top and see the wing portion over here. So when I start making some of these cuts, I'll probably be getting up like this because I like to be just a little taller. But my platform's about five inches tall, which was going to put me a little too high. So, of course, I had a friend in college that said you could never be too high. But I don't know if he was talking about lathe turning or not. But anyway, so let's spin it up and see what we got. And I do always wear a shield. Is the mic okay still with that? Not too echoey. So I am getting vibration early on here. Yeah, I thought that big lump on the one side would be an issue. All right. We'll smooth off the back side, and then I may go. This is like 8.95. I don't know that I can go past the bounce. Oh, okay, because it didn't sound just right to me on this side. I'll try to move it down. Is that okay? All right. So I'm just going to engage the cutting edge. I'm not going to do a bevel-supported cut. So it's a, it's a non-bevel-supported cut, and every time I touch the wood, it makes a cut. So that means there's no ABCs of turning. We all kind of maybe have heard about the anchor bevel cut. So that's anchor the tool find the bevel, and then make a cut. Well, here I anchor the tool, I get a cut every time. If I turn the tool the other direction and I was gonna make a cut this way, I could actually just float the bevel on here, so I anchor, I find the bevel, and then I move the tool into a position where I get a cut. And that will give me the best cut as long as I float the bevel. Um, everybody's always heard about rub the bevel. And this is rubbing, and this is floating. So light touch, if you have bevel support, just light control, downward pressure on the tool rest. You can't get in a rush, you can't push too hard, which gives you a better technique. So coming out here, I could do this all night, but it's gonna take me a longer time to get all that wood leveled off. So I'm gonna do a more aggressive cut, which is a non-bevel supported cut. The only thing is I have to control the cut. I can't rely on that bevel to touch the wood and then move the handle into a position to where it starts the cut. I move the handle this way, it stops the cut. So I just have to be careful how much I force the tool into the wood. Out here, if I push too hard, I get a lot of bounce. So I'm just gonna smooth off for the time being. Again, I don't put a lot of uh, pressure on the tool and I don't put the tool in so that the whole big giant wing engages the wood. Um, David Ellsworth does these big cuts where he's cutting with the whole side wing, three quarter inch shavings are flying off into the audience and everybody thinks 
That's the way you're supposed to turn a bolt. Uh, if you've got a lot of experience and you have good tool control and you want to, you know, really hog some wood, yeah, you can do it, but you got to do it correctly. The general person is probably not going to achieve that straight out of the gate. So I like to make the cut happen. I call it on the sweet spot. It's basically on the little quarter inch curved portion of the gouge, right around that corner. If you turn the tool over too far, it becomes sort of scrapey. It just gets scrapey. If you open it too much, you get a catch. It's going to just self-feed. The wood's going to just pile onto there, and it's a big grab. Rolled over at a 45-degree angle, which is more or less 45, you know, somewhere in that area. If I take my finger and scrape it across the edge of here, like that, it doesn't really cut me. If I scraped it across the end like that, it's not cutting me either. If I take my finger and pull it around that corner, it's going to cut my finger really easy. So, so that's that what you want, want the wood to do. I don't, I don't want to scrape it off. I don't want to dig it in. I want it to come around and just slice the wood off right down the curve, make a nice little spiral cut of fiber coming off of there. If I turn the tool this direction, I cut in the same place. You guys can't really see it behind this handle. As I cut this, it still spirals the wood off into a nice little spiral cut. The wood just sort of cuts itself with the tool being, the tool looks very closed in the video, but it's open about 50 degrees, it's past 45. If I turn it this way, I make the cut happen on that little downward spiral, and that just slices the wood off really nice and clean. So either direction, that corner area coming downhill there, or turning it over and coming downhill around the other side makes the cleanest, most efficient cut. So. That's the area that I'm working on. It's hard to see when I do this non-bevel supported cut because the, the flute looks closed and I'm, you know, coming out and you can't see which direction it's pointed. If I turn it this way, make the cut happen, you see the tools coming off in shavings off that little lower corner right around the bottom edge. So This wood's a little bit drier than I like. I don't like kind of dusting people out and I don't like breathing too much dust when I'm enclosed. Plus greenwood just cuts so nice and clean. We all love that. All right, I'm gonna stop, see if I'm all the way to the outside. Yep, all right, so if you notice, I've kinda, that last little cut I made, I took that corner off a little bit more than I was planning to. I didn't wanna take a lot off that wing because I want the wing to be as far down as I can. What happens in that case is, obviously, I have solid wood all around here, and then as I come out here, I get more air. And the farther I come out, the more air I get, and that one wing is the farthest one out of all the others, so I only have this section right here that's hitting wood. So the cut becomes very easy. So if I don't really concentrate on pulling the tool away from the wood, then it just tends to go that way. So I'll end up curving my wing up. So if you try these, just be really aware that it's really easy to make the wing go upward because you're just putting too much pressure on it. So you have to take wood out and then curve out this way. So I'm going to define my tenon and uh, actually let me move the tool rest in just a little bit closer. I don't want to. I don't want to have the opportunity to get the tool underneath there. I do have. I'm touching the tail stock. Let me go this way. Give myself a little more clearance so I can move the banjo away. Everybody says put the banjo as close as you can to the work for the most tool support. I agree with that to a point, but with a big 5 8 gouge, I have a big sweat back grind on here, and I've got about three quarters of an inch of curve on here. So if my tool rest is a quarter inch away from my wood, and I try to put this tool on, it, it just keeps falling off. So you're going to get kind of frustrated about the third time you do that, and you're going to go try to stick it on there, and you've got an intermittent wing coming around, and you're going to jam it into the wing. So by having it about three quarters of an inch, I can get it past that little curve and get it up on there substantially supported. If this hangs off an inch or inch and a half even, it's not horrible with a 5 8 gouge. So I prefer to give myself a little bit more space. All right, this side is flat. So right there, it's not flat yet. Now it is. So tenon somewhere in that area.
So one thing I set up was my little light. And you have a nice even overhead light here, but my light is real critical. I like this really small little LED, and that gives me the texture. If I have a flat even light on here that's just kind of coming straight in from this side, it doesn't give me that texture. It's not super important now, but I see the texture. And I try to teach people, if you can see the texture, you can sort of stop making it, if you're, especially on a good bevel-supported cut. Now, this is non-bevel supported cut so it tends to not be that smooth but if i really kind of look at the lines and kind of watch my cut and really lighten up i can make a smoother cut my mind's eye works with my hands eventually to make a smoother cut so what i'm saying is if you can't see that you're making these lines if i had a real soft light or a light coming in from this angle to where it washes all this out then I can't stop making the lines. It's like trying to race a line with your eyes closed or in the dark. You just can't see what you're doing. So I like to have the light right there where it really emphasizes the, the texture I'm making. So when I look down there, I can see it real well. So this is gonna be the bowl. I'm gonna start cutting uphill into the wing area. So this will be tenon. And then I will make a little, little step cut, and I'll tell you why I do that. That's a little safety wood, and it also makes my bowl bottom kind of round. That's just gonna, this is all gonna be waste wood, but I need a flat area, and then some waste wood, and then this will be the bowl. So, I still have to keep on the nose. If I come around here, and I keep cutting down that bowl bottom, which this is gonna be the bottom of the bowl, and as I come into the wing, you can hear it start vibrating. It starts getting grabby in there. If I don't close this up and start making a scrape, it'll get really catchy. So I move the handle back over here, so as close to the tailstock as I can get, and I can keep cutting on the nose, which is more efficient. And it doesn't dull the tool down as much. So to dig the wood out of here, as I go deeper into that corner, which is where the bowl is gonna intersect the wing, I just kind of rotate the tool back instead of keeping it over here and jamming that wing into the, into the bowl. It can get very aggressive. So started to do tenon, step cut, bowl bottom. I just stopped. I haven't gone in the curve all the way out to the corner, but I'm going to work on getting that out. I'm going to go deeper into here. Um, I didn't get centered perfectly. And this is kind of, once I started this process, if I want to, I can shift this over, go back between centers, loosen it up, move it over just a little bit, and even this out so that I am hitting perfectly centered in the, in the blank. Um, the only kind of one advantage is that the bowl from the other side might have bark intersecting the edge perfectly even on both sides. Uh, doesn't matter, but if you want to shoot for that. And I've got some nice figure in that. That's a nice crotchwood figure. One thing to remember when you evaluate the log, the side on design, is that your figure is in the middle of the crotch piece. And it only, on a piece like this, it only moves out from the center, maybe three quarters of an inch, something like that, each way. So you might have figure in each half, about half to three quarters of an inch. You start going too much past that, you're going to cut all your figure out. So that's why I'm doing the bowl coming in from this direction, and it opens the bowl up, and I have the figure on the wing and in the bottom of the bowl. And if I do a platter, I don't go really deep. I can't make a real deep platter from this side, because obviously I'll cut all the way through my figure, and I won't have any figure. It'll all be sawdust. So just remember where the figure is and how to achieve it and save as much as you can, because that's the reason I like using the crotch pieces. So I'll take some wood out of here. So now if you can tell in the image that this surface right here is actually pretty smooth. So I've changed techniques just a little bit. Um, I have gone from a, the tool was over here, I'm coming out here and I'm dragging the tool across here. Here I'm in a non-bevel supported position, which doesn't give me a good finish. If I move the tool handle all the way over here, it's as far as I can go. Now I'm on the bevel. I'm just sliding the tool back and forth there. Now I've got a bevel supported cut. So this surface right here is finished. I mean, that's beautiful. That's a good finish cut on that. So that gives me a better surface. So now 
if I engage the bevel, I touch it right there, and as I swing the handle toward me, and as I get to the wing, I close the tool up a little bit, and then start removing a little more wood here. So I go a little deeper. and start working my way out to the wing. So that's going to be my bowl shape. I'm going to take a little more out of here. So this will give me a little bit of a waste wood to round the bottom off a little more. Try to get one nice finished cut on here, and I may not have to go back to it. All right. So that little waste wood will continue my curve as I round out the bottom of the bowl later. And ever since I cut through the bottom at SWAT, I've kind of added that little quarter inch of extra wood down there. And that kind of gives me a little, because I like to round, nice round bottom on the inside. I don't like to come around a corner on the inside and then go straight across. So I'm always trying to curve the bottom really nice. And I used to have the tenon going to a little bit of a flat area, and I didn't have that waste wood. So I always try to leave a little bit of that waste wood so I can get a little bit better bottom design on the inside and hopefully not take the bottom out like I did one time. So that's a little waste wood. So now we can see some ridges, and I'm going to do a bevel-supported cut coming this way. I'm not going to start out here. I like to start in here because I have solid wood, and I can line my bevel up. And a lot of times I'll get my body involved and I'll come out, start picking up the cut. And if you notice part of that, you can see the surface on that one section I did in comparison. This area is nice and smooth going into the rough non-bevel supported cut area. So coming out this way, it was good to hog wood out. Now I'm going to turn around and sort of slowly sneak up the outside and go deeper in here and blend both of these in to make one nice smooth curve all the way out. I don't think I can get any more speed. I have taken some wood out of the bottom, but the bottom's flat. So no matter what wood I take out of the bottom, it's not going to balance it up anymore. If I, have to, if I really need to balance it up better, I need to work on this side. So I could pull the banjo over here and take part of this hump off and then that would help balance it out. I could get more speed, but I'm functioning okay with this. I'm gonna see if I can get it a little bit faster. I don't think I will be able to, but I got past the first bounce, but it's really not too bad. Yeah, that's better. I, I kicked it up 500 more RPM, so that's considerable. So what that helps me is when I touch, I touch this out here, it's not as bouncy. Before it was bump, 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 bump. Now it's just smoother, so it's easier for me to get a good cut. So I'm going to find my bevel right here, and I call this floating the bevel or slipping the bevel. So I'm just kind of sliding back and forth. And what this does is it makes you relax, so you're really not pushing. That's rubbing the bevel. You don't want to do that. That's just too much pressure. It's, it's okay on, well, it's not okay, but it works on smooth wood. But when I get out here, you get really bouncy. So if I just float, by being able to slide back and forth, it really relaxes me. What you can't see from that position, because we're looking at good camera angle on the cut, is that as I'm sliding, I'm moving the handle toward you, and that is engaging. So eventually, as I slide forward, I just keep sliding forward. If I don't get a cut, that's fine. I just keep moving the handle. My body is part of the handle. I just keep moving forward, and eventually, there's a cut. I can see little shavings coming off. So I go a little farther down, a little farther out. A little farther down, a little farther out. Slide out. I don't pick the gouge up and just come out here nilly-willy trying to find it because I've lost track of my bubble contact. I've lost track of where the end is. So I just take that same angle back and I listen. And 
Okay, there I'm past the end. That cut's a little heavier than I wanted, but I'm going to fade it out. I'm going to change my angle slightly. Carry a little farther, go back out. Run it all the way down into the corner, just about. I may do one more cut. So, looking at the shadow, I had a little bobble down in there, but overall, the finish is relatively smooth on that. I, I still need to come back out to the edge. I didn't quite go out far enough to pick up that last part, so we'll make hopefully one more pass. This gouge isn't dull. I've got multiple gouges. I won't be sharpening throughout the demo because it takes too much time. So I, have, I carry multiple gouges with me. This is the second one. I'll go to another one. So pretend I went to the grinder, sharpen that. So before I do this last finish cut, I'll go to the grinder and use a sharp tool and try to pick this up. I'm going to put this tool rest in a little closer, give me a little better support so I'm not reaching quite so far off. One thing when you're doing these wing bowls, there's two things, there's several things that's important, but two of the major things is contact of the wings. You're not used to intermittent cut. If a round bowl hits something, it's not that big a deal. Um, banjo, is got, I've got about that. Yep, that's the longest one. So that one's about three quarters to an inch or so maybe off the banjo. You gotta worry about the banjo too. If, there was, if it was any bigger than this, I would have to position the banjo over here and put the tool rest over here, which is not a problem, but we're normally not used to doing that. So be a little careful with where the banjo is in relationship to the thing. We always tend to put it at an angle, which is a little good for support, but sometimes that's not convenient. and give it a spin check. They always tell you to do that, but it's really important on these guys. All right, so find my bevel. What you can't see in a demo is how much easier that cut was than the other cut with the dollar gouge. It just, the tool just kind of floated through there. I pretty much, it wasn't, it's not perfect. It could be better. Yeah, I hate those high definition cameras. It has to be the primary, yeah, because the primary is the one that supports the edge. So the other one just gets the wood out of the way. The other one would be back here, but I can, I first, you know, sometimes I'll error on a lot more back of the heel, and then I'll find my cutting edge. So it's yeah, just that 3 16 or whatever, 3 30 seconds primary bubble right there. Let's try this one again, see if I can get a better finish than that. Tonight's not my lucky night, but I always like to leave a little uh, imperfect finish because I'll talk to you about my negative rake scraper. So if you get the perfect cut with the bowl gouge, stop at the store on the way home, buy a lottery ticket because it's a lucky day. But if not, break out. My, my favorite tool in the world is my bowl gouge. I do 90% of everything I do with the bowl gouge, either the 5 8 or the half inch. Uh, next favorite tool would be my negative rake scraper. And everybody's saying, it looks like a skew. And yes, it did start life as a skew. It was a Doug Thompson uh, rounded edge skew. It doesn't have to have the rounded edge. That just happens to be what I started with because it was already cut at an angle. Um, the difference is this angle is more acute. Um, it could, doesn't have to be this acute, but to get in the corners of the wing, I, I have ground it like this over the years. 
And there looks like two different bevels. There's like a, a long one and a short one. But that's only because I use it in this position most of the time. And I have ground it on this side to raise a burr on this side. So that's, this bevel gets ground more often than this one. Sometimes I, they're the same angles. Um, it is about 50 degrees included angle. So this angle right here is equilateral top and bottom. It's not different from one side to the other. It's included 50 degrees there. So I can grind it on the grinder this direction, raise a burr on the top side, or flip it over and grind it this angle and it raises the burr on this side. So top or bottom, it doesn't matter because I will use it in this manner here. And then if I need it on this side of the wing, I can't use it like this, so I need it this direction, so I grind the opposite side, raise the burr over here, and now I come into the wing on this side, this direction, so they're the same. Some companies will grind them, you get, get them from craft supplies or whatever, they have one ground, they're not equilateral. They're 50 degrees or 60 degrees, but they're ground different. Steeper on one side than the other means you have to have a right-handed one and a left-handed one. So that's two scrapers they sell you. And then you need a right-handed round one and a left-handed round one. So mine, I just grind them the same on, you just flip them. So you only have one round one, one diagonal one. So we'll touch this with the negative rake scraper and see if I can smooth those out. And it also has a little bit of a rocker to it. It's not flat, so my curved wings, I can touch it and smooth out corners and just little transition lines. Negative rake scrapers are a wonderful thing. I saw Stuart Batty do demos years ago when I was first started turning, and um, he did a lot of wing balls, deep bases and stuff, so, so that smoothed that out a little bit better. Kind of took some of the surface little irregularities off a little bit. So um, it's made for hardwoods. It was designed for ivory or African blackwood, um, Aussie burls that are really brittle and hard. You try to cut them. Um, here are the um, was it Texas ebony you guys have. I think we were talking about that uh, with Todd. Uh, it's very hard, and he says his scraper worked better. The negative rake scraper probably would give you a very good finish on that. It's not meant for, it will tell you, there's an article on my website about that, and there's also a link and a PDF a thick file from Stuart's article from many years ago talking about that. Um, it basically cuts with the burr. If there's no burr, it doesn't cut. So the negative angle on top kind of negates the aggressiveness of a bevel that steep pointed into the wood. But if you don't have a burr, it's so, you know, push being, the wood's being pushed off on the top, so it really doesn't do much. You'd have to push harder, which is not what you want to do. You notice I was just barely floating that on there, and it just surfaced it up. I can do the same thing on an 8-inch thick wing, even a 16-inch thick wing, and smooth out transition lines with this. So what the other thing I did, I took the point, and I go in that corner, and I incise a little bit of a line. And I'm kind of kind of gauge my corner there. I want about maybe a 45 degree angle of entry into the wing because I got to match it on the other side. So I don't want to get into trouble of trying to stick something in a very tight corner tonight. So my 40 degree gouge will go in a 40 degree corner on the other side where the bowl comes out of the wing. So I try to sort of try to start visualizing that. So let me get my tenon set up and put this thing in the chuck. Okay. Um, I've got dovetail jaws on my Vic Mark and I have ground my uh, parting tool into a bevel angle, which sort of matches my dovetail. So I can go in like this on the corner of the tenon, and that corner point cleans out the corner where the jaws of the tenon have to go. So I want that corner really clean. I can't get it with a bowl gouge. You can get in there with a, whatever, a 30 degree spindle gouge and clean that corner out pretty good. Al Hockenberry says, I should do it with a gouge because I'm going to cut it cleaner and I'll get a better cut, but this is just so quick and easy, I can, I just do this. He just gives me grief about that all the time. So I'm just going to give a nice flat surface in there. I want this flat part of the bottom right here to be really, really nice and flat so that corner is really clean. 
and I get a really good tenon grab in there. Nice and flat, good. Okay. So basically, this side is pretty much finished. I would be, if I wanted to sand, I could sand now a little bit. It's very difficult and a little bit unsafe to sand that intermittent cut. Um, I would not stick my hand on there with paper or anything. You cut my third favorite tool is my Grex random orbit sander. So this cures many ills. Um, it basically now, if I wanted to, I could air this up and not while it's running, just I can hold my hand behind here and I can just sand, you know, vibrate. It's an orbital sander, it just kind of vibrates. And I can just sand that in 20 seconds. I could just clean that up a little bit if I needed to. Um, I do have self-powered sander. Um, these are like spinny, um, self-powered or whatever, random, not random orbit, but uh, inertia sander, some people call them. And I do feel fairly comfortable touching this and they tell you to sand at slower speeds but obviously on an intermittent cut it's not easy to sand slow but just that much sanding just sort of started to smooth that out already so it just touches the bottom and as it touches it spins and can go that I could turn speed down a little bit but this isn't a sanding thing so I'm just I'm not going to worry about that wrong figure this out by the end of tonight. Knockout bar. Got it. All right. Oh, okay. I'll just talk for 30 seconds. Um, I like the dovetail jaws. It doesn't matter. A lot of people have preferences. I'm not going to poo-poo one over the other. I used to say that it would be physically impossible to pull a dovetail jaw out of, I mean, dovetail tenon out of a dovetail jaw because they do what they're supposed to do. As it grabs the dovetail, it pulls it tight and it holds it in and you'd be trying to pull a bigger piece of wood out of a smaller hole. It's not going to happen. I did it in a demo one time. I got, uh, a piece of green wood, ingrain base, and I was hollowing the in, I was making cuts on the inside, and I stopped for a minute, and I, ha I always kind of use my body to make my cuts, so I had the tool, after making a cut, somebody asked me a question, and I stood up, and looked up, which raised my body, which shoved the gouge, it pivoted the point right into the side of the base, and the video camera was right in on it tight, and it just got the most spectacular catch you'd ever imagine, and it just yanked the thing right out of it. I mean, it didn't tear the tenon off, it didn't do anything, it just pulled it right out of the chuck. And I was able to put it back in the chuck, and it worked okay. I wouldn't recommend doing it, but I thought it was almost a physical impossibility, but I've discovered now nothing is impossible in what we do. There's people that could break bowling balls, and all right, I, my process is, and I could have made my, te could have made my tenon a little bit smaller. I usually like about an eighth of an inch gap. Um, but that's pretty close. Uh, I get it centered, push it in, and then snug it, but I don't tighten it up because I don't want any chance of it moving if I tighten and the jaws push it out. So then I put the live center in, push pressure against it, spin it, and then start tightening. And then I don't tighten one side as much as I can because it's supposed to tighten concentrically, but I don't think it does all the time. It may not. Some cheaper chucks tend to move it sideways a little bit. So I tighten one a little bit and go to the next one and then just keep kind of going around until hopefully they tighten evenly. Because I don't want to shove this out of position any because I don't want to really have to recut the other side. If I shove it out of position and it has some run out, I need to cut this. And one of the steps, and I haven't read my hand out in a while, but one of the steps says, when I do this, I think it's, I think, I think it's highlighted and bold. It says, check to see that it's running true. If it isn't, recut this other side. I don't like doing it over here. It's awkward. It, uh, you guys can't see it on the camera. So I generally don't do it. And it never is horrible. If it does run out slightly, you will 
tell when I'm done because one wing will be slightly thicker than the other wing. If you're out uh, even a sixteenth of an inch, which is quite a bit, uh, and you're doing a quarter inch thick wing, it's not horrible. One side might be three sixteenths, the other side's a quarter. You can take that wonderful Greg sander and you can just taper that quarter inch like a little bit and the ends edges look the same and nobody's going to put a mic on it or, or caliper it. If they do, don't give them the bowl because they don't deserve it. Uh, if you're a sixteenth of an inch wing and you're a sixteenth of an inch out, and then, yeah, you got a problem because you'll have wings on one side, no wings on the other side. And my brother-in-law has done that because he didn't read number five in the handout that said recut the other side. And he's bad about making bad tenons, and the thing's always ru running wonky. And he cut several wings off before he called me and said, what the heck am I doing? I'm like, uh, I don't know. Are, are you truing it up when you put it in? Uh, no. He said, you never do that. I'm like, no, I'm professional. <laughs> my mind's perfect every time. So, but anyway, he didn't like that, but yeah. Uh, I turn the speed down, turn it on, bring it up to speed. And I'll get my light kind of over here. And it's running good. So, good to go on that. All right. Take some wood out of this side. And it was running fine. But that's why we slow it down, bring it up to speed, just in case. This is going to stay in, in case something happens. I was at 800. I had a little wobble before I had gotten it up to 15, which is probably OK. So I'll take it back up to that. All right. So we're good. Everything's still tight. I started with the number two gouge. That's my duller one. So I'm going to now just start working on the hump. So just reach out here, find the hump. So I can see two levels. I don't know if the overhead can see that. And let me know if the, care, if the thing's in the way, which I can move it. That's still in the way. Try that. All right. What I want the light to light it up. It'll help me a lot because I need to see the, the ghost image, and that light helps me. Right now I can see a very shallow, about inch and a half thick area, and then this big hump. This is the big hump. That's the small hump. So I'm going to just take one more little cut on the small hump and then move up on top of the big hump. And this is where the bark might start flying off, so be careful on the front row. I apologize if I'm trying to take kind of light cuts and not yank bark off. So I'm reaching off the rest a pretty good ways. I'm close, like right here, I'm only a quarter inch or three quarters away, but out there, I'm way past the edge. So here, I kind of think I went too far in. What I was going to tell you, you have to watch for is where the outside of the bowl is. So what I'm looking for is the, the ghost image of the bowl on the inside and the projection of the bowl on the outside. So really, my bowl should have been maybe an eighth of an inch or a little farther out here. So maybe that wasn't just getting rid of that hump. Might have gotten rid of too much of the hump already. You can't just come in here and start flattening that side off, obviously, if you want the natural edge around the bowl. So I'm going to move the tool rest over to this part and finish off the wing. So right here, I'm inside of that, about an eighth of an inch away, and I'm about three quarters. I might go a little closer there, make sure I'm clear there. All right. So I got to thin this down to whatever thickness I'm going to go. I'm going to work on that now. And I'll probably do most of it to about a half and then start thinning just the edge. So we're all clear. Spin it up. The other thing you've got to watch for is your arm in relationship to the, the corner of the wing. So I try to, there's a lot of things, a lot of little things to keep track of. One thing you can do if you're not used to this and you come way in here, your arm can get close to that wing because I cannot, no matter where I put the light, I cannot see that wing very well. One thing that works well is to um, take a piece of uh, blue painter's tape, about four inches long, fold it over and stick it on your arm. Just stick it right there so that it sticks out about two inches. So it just, just tape it to your arm. You got two inches of tape sticking out there. So if you start coming in too close and you're concentrating on the cutting edge up in here, that two inches of tape will start flapping. 
you'll, you'll hit it with the wing, and trust me, you'll jerk your hand out of there. It'll scare the bejesus out of you because that, and you'll feel it vibrate on your arm. Uh, so, but it's, it's better than getting hit. So just be careful. Another warning of, don't ask me how I know about all these little things. Demonstrators will say, people have told us, but it never happened to me. So just, I'm just doing a corner. I've got to do about the first inch. The thinner you go, I could continue doing this non-bevel supported cut or turn around and cut back this direction, which will give me a smoother finish. And what I'm trying to do is parallel the top side to the bottom side. So I can see the ghost image. Don't know if the camera is going to pick that up, but if you notice right there, this thickness is even both sides. So it's the same thickness, quarter inch thick, three, three eighths thick, top and bottoms even. So I just need to take more wood out, move that as thin as I want. So we'll take a little bit more. Wow, this little dial is really sensitive. I just bumped it up probably a ton of RPMs by just barely touching it. You gotta be careful with that. So just taking some wood away and I'll blend this out and then back up. I'll find my bevel, back out to the edge. Just rough taking wood out of here. A little dustier than I like. I like a little more. This wood's a little bit drier, but it was really pretty. I used it in a demo about a month ago, and the cherry's pretty nice. So I've got to line my head up, body up, everything with the wing. So I can see the thickness on both sides with my light. So fairly parallel, I may be getting a little thicker, but I'm gonna stop and take a look. Yeah, so you can, I don't know if the camera picks it up somewhere. Yeah, maybe you can see it. I'm a little thicker back here than here, but not bad. I'm going to go ahead and take some more bulk out, get rid of that hump. Actually, I need to move my tool rest, I think. Yeah. And this is just a lot of bulk removal. That's a big hump on that side. Make an interesting bowl. Again, that was a non-bevel supported cut. And I'm just turning the gouge around. I'll be coming into the wood. And again, I just slide the bevel forward, slip it backwards, pick up the cut again. You have to do it in stages. Once you go thin out here, you can't go back, pick up the cut.
All right, so I'm getting close. Okay, still getting a little thicker. I'm going to try to go, uh-oh, maybe not. All right, a little check has turned into a little crack, it seems like. All right, I don't know. I've got a little check crack coming in there, so I'm going to, I'm going to leave that thickness that I have. I can't really go into this corner with this 60-degree gouge much anymore, so I'm going to go to my 40 and come down the side of the bowl here and see if I can true that up and match this up. Now, it's safer if I go to a smaller tool rest and come in this direction. All right, so now I'm running the tool rest this way rather than reaching over with that other one because it's a smaller gouge. So this is a whole lot safer this way. I do have the functionality of the tool rest being again, or the banjo being up against the tailstock, but I think I'm okay with this. So what I'm looking at now is the outside bowl and the inside bowl, and I've sort of matched it up, but I've taken, I took too much off my rim to start with, so I'm going to have to make my bowl a little smaller. So when I get to the wall, I just roll the flute over and do a little shear scrape down that wing to level that out and see if I can make another cut. Can you tell that the top and bottom bowl doesn't match? <laughs> All right. I had to totally reshape the bowl because I went way too far in here and I'd cut the whole rim off. I didn't want to make this one quite that small, but I can adjust. Now I've got enough wood to fix the bottom when I turn it around, or I could probably do it now. So I'm going to go ahead and smooth this area out, um, turn this around this direction. Now that the side of the bowl is done, I'll come in and try to pick up, if I'm not too flexible here, pick up a cut coming this way and even that out. If I don't have too much warp, yeah, it's not bad. So again, light touch on this. It's really, really a light touch. I tend to put my hand over, but really, it's just a very light I can't really get in there any tighter with the 60. I could go with the 40, but I'm going to take that's clean there. I just have that little transition to do. So I'm going to take the negative brake scraper and clean that corner up just a smidge. So if you notice, I'm all the way out on the outside of the wing with the negative brake scraper. So I really do get really, really fine shavings that are actually coming off this negative rake scraper. And I went pretty much out to the outside edge of the wing, even with the crack in there, and smoothed out most all of that surface. So don't try it with a regular scraper, whole different animal. There's a lot of good, there's articles on my website about it, mine, Stuart Batty's. Uh, there's also a little handout on this 
um, and it's basically a little jig setup, some information, which that's a full-size template, which gives you a little setup jig, which makes this little thing, which sets up the grinder table. So that's just a quick way of making some way to gauge your grinder setup. So that's available on the website. How much time do I got? Five minutes? You the story of my life. I talk too much and don't turn enough. It's all the safety stuff I tell you about at the beginning. Uh, well, yeah, I got to get that in there because I, I don't want anybody getting hurt. I don't think I can get in on this side now. I'll just wait till later. Let's go ahead and just hollow the bowl out. All right, so this stuff. Same process as I did at SWAT. I'm going to be running behind schedule. Oh, geez, up against the thing, can't get it off. At least take this out of here. So now it's pretty much just a bowl until I have to make the adjustment on the outside. That's a little close. All right. I'll mess the whole camera up if I move the uh, headstock, won't I? We'll try to deal with this. Well. It'll take too long. I'll run out of time. Let me just go ahead and see if I can deal with it. Is that too bad on the camera? So pretty much just small bowl. Work my way to the outside of the rim, pretty much. I like to leave bulk in the middle because I don't want it to warp on me too much. So I'm just gonna take these little cuts down. You notice the gouge bounces. If you ever have the gouge bouncing like that, it's because you are trying to cut too fast and take too much wood out. The wood doesn't wanna be cut that fast. Several things you can do, go to the grinder, sharpen the tool, get a sharper gouge, slow down your process. Don't try to cut so much in a hurry or speed the lathe up. We're still, we're going pretty much almost 2,000 RPM, so I'm not gonna speed it up any more than that. So it's just the wood doesn't wanna cut quite as fast as you wanna cut it. All right, going for about the same thickness Okay, I'm a little thicker. All right, I'm getting thicker down there, so I need to take a little more out of the middle. This part is thicker because that's down here. This rim thickness is about close to that, so I'm good with that. So let's get a little more out of the middle. I like leaving the little steps because it gives me some guidance. And then I can always just come in and set the tool right in there, pick up my cut. I'm erroring on a little bit of a flat bottom because I don't want to go too deep yet. We'll make some measurements in a minute. I don't have to worry about cutting through my bowl on the outside. One thing you have to be concerned about when you line your top bowl up with your bottom bowl is that the top bowl is actually inside or even with the outside bowl. Obviously, if the top bowl is outside of the bottom bowl rim, when you go down the inside, you're going to, okay, everybody's nodding their head, you're going to cut the bowl right out of the wing. So make sure that that's either lined up. If I'm on the inside, there's no way I'm going to cut. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's hardly a way I'm going to cut through the side of my bowl. I might cut through the bottom, but I'm fixing to take my 
laser guided bottom finder and do a check on the measurements no matter how close I am on time. So this is a just a laser pointer set in a level here. That laser point points to right there. So if I push it on here, push the button and hold it, it's telling me I've got a good five eighths or more right here. So I can go obviously a whole lot deeper. Figured I could, but we were just double checking. So I'm going to pick this cut up about here. It's a little heavier cut than I like to take, but it's working. I think I'm okay. I'm going to double check my measurements make one more cut. I've learned how not to go through the bottom now. Uh, here we're and that's, that's tell you I'm going to do one more cut and do, or two more, and then just do one. But I got to be careful because I got to get rid of the bowl on the outside. Still thick. Okay. One more time. Okay, we'll live with that. Am I about out of time? What's that? Pyographer? It's clubs to keep. You're very welcome to do that. I would not mind at all. So it's up to the guys that are going to take possession of it. All right, that is kind of a nice looking figure in the bottom that's kind of pretty. A little beefy. Um, we'll jam chuck it, turn it around, take the tenon off and all that stuff. Uh, rubber Chucky product, it's a urethane rubber stuff. We make them out of wood. You can use whatever you want to pad the bowl. Some people say mouse pads. I don't like mouse pads. I don't like any kind of rubber stuff. If I'm going to do them out of wood, I use a leather, a really thin eighth of an inch leather. Mouse pad is too squishy. I don't want the thing to be wiggling around on me. So I prefer uh, a soft, kind of a, not soft, but a somewhat All right, we'll see how lucky we get. Well, see, everybody loves this. Uh, there's a lady that makes the Dusty Gone masks, Paula, Paula Nix. Uh, she makes these, and uh, it keeps the splinters out of the wife's bra. I don't care about splinters in my socks, but when you... You know, but they get in the socks, they transfer to the... To the dryer, washer, and they get in everything else. So I'm going to turn the speed down. I think I'm running a little off. No, well, maybe not. Turn on. Yep. I don't have time to mess with this too much, but I'd like to be better than that. Jeez, that's not good at all.
one of those things when it warps too much. That's uh, better. Now that I get it perfect, I need more space. Had it. It's close. I don't have time to mess with it too long. That's no. We'll go with that. All right. Spin it up. And hopefully I'm thick enough that I can match these up. You guys tell? Is it close? One more cut. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah, yeah. That one more. All right. So we're not bad on the blend. Let's see if we can smooth that out. It's not running true, and the wing is sort of warped. But... Listen for that little potato chip scratchy sound. I think I'm pretty thick in the bottom. Or uh, David Ellsworth likes to describe it as a little rich in the bottom. Probably to turn the speed down before I did that last little party cut in the bottom, but... Little beefy butt, we're out of time. Yeah. Kind of thick. But anyway, no lights coming through it, so it's no little thick. All right, so that's the idea. That's the uh, little thing, and I think the bottom's up above the wing, so by the time I cut the little nubby off, Really nice figure on the bottom, kind of looks in the bottom of the ball, nice through the wing, so yeah. Nice shape, um, I touched, I have no transition line on this side, but I do have a little on this side. I left this because that can sand down, that's a little proud. If I take this off, I'll go into this side. So then I'll have a tre you know, trench over here, that won't sand out. So that little bit of sanding right there, that'll sand out with the Grex really kind of quick. So. And the crack actually held together. Thank you all very, very much. I appreciate it.